All right. I sometimes forget that to like halfway through and I'm like, oh crap, missed the first part. But, um, so thanks, Jay. Appreciate the, uh, the introduction there and uh, nice to see you all here. Um, and so, uh, you know, appreciate you joining us uh, for this, this discussion. You know, uh, as Jay mentioned, uh, the topic's really about agile leadership and that, that mindset shift that we're looking for from uh, leaders to help their companies become agile, right? And so uh, just a few things to, to mention at the start here. I, I, uh, as I mentioned, the description of the talk here, uh, we're going to go into Bill Joyner's um, uh, leadership agility model a bit. So there's a book out there uh, written by Bill Joyner and Stephen mm -hmm. Josephs. Uh, so if you're looking for a reference there, uh, it's about this thick, uh, good stuff. Uh, I'd say a little bit, you know, kind of PhD academic style, but uh, there's some really good nuggets in there, of course. Uh, and we'll sort of cover some highlights here that uh, can sort of point you in the right direction there too. So um, along with that, uh, some of the content we go through is actually from uh, our certified agile leadership class, uh, which also follows the curriculum from agile leadership journey. If you're familiar with those guys, uh, Pete Barron's and crew. Uh, so been a uh, part of their group for, I don't know, five years or so. Uh, and actually the last place I was before COVID hit, I was out at uh, Pete's house. He has a, a retreat every year before COVID. Uh, we would do for the Agile Leadership uh, Journey uh, trainers. And so that was the, the last thing I did before COVID hit. We had that retreat, came home, and the world shut down. So uh, it's kind of a memorable thing for me. But uh, anyway, so we're going to go through some of that content just sort of uh, to help us uh, through the discussion here. And uh, as we go, please feel free to, to uh, shout out questions. I, I think Jay might have us uh, sort of on a, a bit of lockdown uh, to prevent any nefarious things from happening, but if you uh, can put things in the chat or uh, you know, if you do have a question, try to indicate that somehow, because I love questions, love to talk through stuff uh, rather than me just prattle on for, for an hour or so. Uh, so my uh, my talk here is probably about the neighborhood of you know, 35, 45 minutes was the plan, and then just uh, you know, leave some time for discussion and questions and things like that as well. So, so I've got uh, three major concepts to sort of go through here to sort of lead us into that, uh, at least through the discussion tonight. And uh, before I do that, uh, Jay mentioned a few things, but uh, I'll just mention a few more since uh, we just started recording and uh, just a little about me. So uh, so my name is Aaron Copel. I live in Indianapolis. Uh, we have a company called Project Brilliant. I'm actually the CEO. And I've been doing this for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, something like that. Uh, depends on if you count my startup days uh, as, as part of my agile curriculum and career, I guess. Uh, I do, because uh, that's, I think, where it came from for me. Uh, and that's kind of what I say now is I, I help large companies try to act more like a startup, right? Get focused on value and cut through the bureaucracy and all that kind of stuff. And I really focus on the things that matter, right? And along with that, of course, comes the leadership mindset, not just getting software built, but all the stuff that comes with it to make that work, right? The environment and uh, the organization and leadership. And so for what we do at Project Brilliant, we focus a lot on this kind of stuff, helping organizations through agile transformations, helping leaders, uh, you know, start to shift that mindset and, and help them understand why that's valuable. Um, and of course, we also do training. So lots of training. I'm a certified Scrum trainer. Uh, we do lots of certified Scrum master, certified Scrum product owner, and of course, certified agile leadership, uh, and a few other things as well. Uh, and so pretty much cover the gamut there. Um, but that's what we do to help organizations really understand this stuff and then try to make it work for them, right? Um, so with that said, we're, we're going to go into the talk for tonight. Uh, again, please uh, feel free to pop questions in the chat or, or yell them out. I'm happy to do that too. Uh, take those as they come. So to start with, I wanted to sort of take a step back uh, before we dive into agile leadership and just talk about uh, leadership and management in general, right? So when we think about leadership, it's often, you know, the person out there with an inspiring vision leading everyone around and, uh, you know, follow me kind of stuff. But I want to start with more of just what's management, right? And that's where, you know, usually we think about the two very closely associated, uh, but want to talk about sort of the history of where management managers have come from. Um, and so uh, as we start here, uh, I've got this chart behind me. I, I don't have any slides. I don't really like to do slides unless I have to. I love to draw. This is how I do my training as well. So we're just going to do that. Uh, so you might want to, I think in the corner up here, one of these corners, I forget which direction I'm pointing on the screen because mine's mirrored. Uh, but the, there's a button there. You can go to like speaker view. That'll make me really big. So you can probably see better if you want to. Um, but so the script behind me, uh, this history of management up here at the top. And so the axes here, the speed and complexity of work is the vertical axis. And horizontal, of course, is time. Uh, I'm just going to go through some uh, you know, high-level time periods here. And so as we think about management as we know it today, uh, we're usually thinking about uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, the Industrial Revolution, right? When people started uh, coming into cities, working in factories, they're out you know, in uh, agriculture, things like that, farms. And in the Industrial Revolution, that's when people started coming to cities, factories, starting to work those kind of jobs that maybe they had not done before, right? Uh, and so this is kind of new stuff, new new endeavor for them. And so uh, we call this period of time management 1.0. And we also associate this guy named Frederick Taylor with this period of time. Uh, and so uh, if you don't know Frederick Taylor, pretty uh, well-known guy uh, for the time period, did some really revolutionary stuff. 
and wrote a book called Scientific Management. And so uh, what was going on was, uh, you know, people working in factories and, and the role of managers was basically to help these people know what to do, right? Very tactical kind of stuff, right? And so if they were in a steel mill, for example, uh, you know, hammering out steel, so this uh, manager would be helping that person know exactly what to do uh, on that line, uh, what steps to take and how to manage it and sort of inputs and, and really keeping track of a lot of uh, mostly input kind of metrics, which is, you know, did you show up on time? How many hours did you work? And did you, you know, take enough swings at the, the steel and that kind of stuff? And so one thing we think about here, I, I usually associate one of the jobs there is like you're shoveling coal into the blast furnace, right? To get it really hot, melt steel. And so in that case, what's happening here with the manager uh, really starting to help, you know, that person really understand what to do, how to do it well, and also starting to set things like baseline metrics, right? What's, what's a good employee look like in this scenario? And so this is where Frederick Taylor comes in with some of his thinking, which is starting to apply the scientific management method he had and starting to put metrics to things. So one of the things he brought was uh, performance metrics. Uh, and often we still have these kind of things today in the same kind of way, but these metrics, for example, of how many shovels of coal can a person shovel into a blast furnace in five minutes? And then let's do the math and figure out how much they should do in eight hours. And boom, there we have a baseline, right, that we should shoot for. And people that do more than that, maybe they get paid a few dollars extra. People that do less than that, maybe they're at risk for getting thrown out and we'll get someone who can work better, right? That kind of stuff. So those metrics those performance management type metrics really trying to do uh, that management style of very hands-on tactical kind of approach uh, and really a command and control mindset, right? We're truly trying to tell this person exactly what to do, right? So metrics, and we, we think about this as sort of a command and control period. But if we think about it, what was going on before Frederick Taylor was pretty ad hoc, not a lot of measurement. It was just sort of go in and, and just sort of tell people to work faster, right? But there wasn't really a baseline metric to look at to see if they were doing well or not. Uh, or if they were doing outstanding and that we should, you know, replicate what they're doing and have them mentor people and things like that. It was really just sort of a, an ad hoc situation, just trying to get work done, right? And so the management philosophy here, we really think about what they're, they're reviewing and paying attention to the most from a management standpoint is really the input side of things, right? Are people showing up? Are they, are they you know, shoveling the coal, that kind of stuff? So it's really a lot of the front end stuff in the process of managing the inputs uh, into this process, so inputs. So from a worker standpoint, uh, maybe not the best thing in the world, but might have been better for them than ad hoc as well, because it wasn't just ambiguous, right? Now, maybe they have some target to shoot for and things like that. So maybe not the best life, but maybe better than it was, right? But from a company standpoint, what companies saw that was started to follow Frederick Taylor's methods was they started to outpace their competitors pretty heavily because they started to have these kind of metrics to pay attention to and know if they were doing well and could do better. Uh, where they could look for improvements and things like that, right? So pretty revolutionary stuff, really awesome things for the time in that era, right? But as we fast forward a little bit here, uh, so about 50 years, couple generations post-World War II, we get into what we uh, consider the lean movement, right? And so I'm sure we all know the stories about Toyota production systems and things like that. Edwards Deming going over, uh, bringing some thinking there about uh, how things could be different than this sort of straightforward command and control style. And so what he was looking at was, how do we start looking at the the broader system a bit and people's role in that system, not just inputs and are they doing that one task and then we'll tell them to do next task, next task, next hour, that kind of stuff, but really putting them into a different situation from a management perspective. And so in that case, what we're looking for here from a manager's role is to look at the end to end of, hey, we're like, for example, on a, a car assembly line, right? So we're starting to build a car and what I'm looking for is to get a good output. I'm gonna get cars off the, off the end of the line and get them out to customer stands, right? And so what they're looking for employees to do is really specialize in their one area of the assembly line. And if I'm the guy that puts the steering wheel on, I get really good at doing that, right? I do it every day, all day, and I get really good at it. And because of that, I start to understand for myself without the manager's help, what a good input to me looks like from the previous station and what a good output looks like to the next guy, right? Because I'm doing that all the time. And I start to really uh, understand it in depth, right? Probably better than anyone else because I'm the one doing that job every day, all day, all the time, right? And so you can start to rely on this person uh, and their judgment for that specific piece of the puzzle, right? And so we've got here is starting to build a lot more trust with our employees. They've got more experience, right? Uh, in management in this era of early 1900s, they might've just come off farms and had never done this kind of work before, but now we've got a couple generations. We've got some practices we've developed that they can utilize and things like that. And from a management standpoint, we can go beyond just managing the inputs to managing the outputs, right? So we start to look at, did they do a good job? Is the quality there of what that person did at their station? So we start to trust their judgment on their particular piece of the puzzle, and we can start to focus on the quality aspects of it. 
And so not just quality from this person's station, but quality on the sequence of events that results in a car. And we can look at the end result and say, is that car of quality, right? Does it work properly? And so we start to manage differently in that paradigm where instead of just managing the outputs and tasks, we're starting to manage outputs and quality aspects, right? And so is this thing ready to, to actually hand over to a customer and let them use it, right? So a little bit different mindset from a manager there of instead of managing inputs, now we're managing, of course, like I said, outputs. Get my purple marker back here. Outputs. And so on this curve of work getting more complex and speeding up, right? So we're going beyond just manual labor type tasks, like directly of shoveling coal and, and you know, uh, blasting out um, uh, steel rods and things like that into assembling a more complicated machine like a car, right? So the work is getting a bit more uh, complicated. And so our adaptation by workers is to put more information, more responsibility in their hand because they're close to the work. The manager takes one step back and is managing a little bit bigger view of the world, right? So as this curve starts to, to go up, the, the hockey stick curve here starts to go up, managers can't be everywhere, they can't do everything. And so they've got to start to put more responsibility and trust into people. And so again, take one step back and start looking at a little bit big, bigger picture. But as this curve starts to increase even more rapidly as we get towards uh, the information age, right? Management 3.0 era, here towards the uh, end of the two, or end of the 1900s into the 2000s and to now, uh, things are starting to move really fast, and even faster. Right? We put AI on here as like maybe a, an additional piece of this paradigm, but but things are just moving so fast. It's hard for any one person to keep up. It's hard for any manager to know exactly what to do next. What they've got to do is start putting more trust even into the people, and but individuals are going to have a tough time, just like the manager would, trying to figure out all the different aspects of what's going on. So what we want to do is start forming teams of people with cross-functional skills, different experiences, diversity of thought and uh, capabilities and things like that, putting them into a true team where they can now be in charge of decision-making and taking action in real time, right? And so in the case where like back here in management one, one or 2.0, when something goes wrong, there's probably still an escalation to a manager who might have to run it up a management chain, get a decision, bring that back down, and then relay the message, and then we, we proceed, right? In this kind of paradigm where things are moving so fast, we don't have time for that stuff. We don't have time to wait for escalations and answers to come back down. We need these people to be able to make those decisions quickly. Otherwise, we're going to lose, right? We're just going to be behind the eight ball all the time and, and just struggling to keep up. And so we want to do as a manager is really start to put these teams into a position where they can be successful. And that means not, not necessarily that the managers and the, the management team have all the information. We want these people to have the information, right? So the manager's job is not to manage the day-to-day -day work. It's to manage the, the, the environment in which those people can have the information and tools they need, right? Set them up for success, create the environment where they can be successful with the information, the tools, the right procedures and policies and all that kind of stuff that will, will enable them to do their work rather than get in the way, right? That kind of stuff. So we're looking for here again, uh, team-based and really cross-functional cross-functional and diversity of thought, that kind of stuff. So if they have all the pieces and parts and tools and knowledge and information and skills they need to actually take action in real time. And if they were to wait for a manager to take action, escalate, bring it back and give them an answer, they're probably not going to get as good an answer because guess what? By the time that happens, even if it was the right answer to the problem they had, the problem is probably changed because they waited too long, right? That kind of stuff. So that's what we're thinking here with this kind of paradigm is things are moving so fast, we really need to set those teams up for success. Now, as we think about that, the management, again, mindset here back in 1.0 is manage the inputs, make sure people are doing their, their tasks, right? Management 2.0, let's set them up a little bit more autonomy, right? They understand their piece of the puzzle. The manager's job is to make sure all the pieces of the puzzle go together and then an output occurs. And in this case, it's not just that an output occurs in management 3.0, it's really that we get the outcome that we desire, which oftentimes we refer to as happy customers, things like that, right? So, so we wanna put these people in charge of trying to understand customers' needs, understand the problem, have all the information and tools they need to be able to make that happen. And this requires a really different mindset uh, from the manager, right? The manager has to be able to do that and, and understand that's their job. And their job is not to manage the work, it's to create the environment where these people can be successful. That's a very different approach to management. And so, what we see, unfortunately, today, even still, is that you've got the, the progression of uh, the problem, right? So the speed of work and complexity of work is increasing. We're hoping that our people can start to adapt here. They go from just doing tasks to managing their, their piece of the puzzle to then hopefully operating as a successful team. But what we see oftentimes is the management um, capabilities, management understanding, 
their knowledge and skill and understanding of what they should do hasn't quite kept pace. And what we often see is managers, if you sort of look at the curve for managers and that understanding, looks something like this probably. There was a lot of good management thinking going into the middle of the 19th century uh, and really think about all the stuff from, again, from Toyota production systems, our Demings, that kind of stuff. And a lot of good thinking there, but it's kind of leveled off, right? And I would say most organizations, the managers are probably in sort of a management 2.0 paradigm where they're still trying to manage the outputs and make sure people are, are doing their piece and the manager's kind of responsible still for the whole picture though, in terms of getting an output, but they're not so much focused on outcomes and setting up for success out here with teams, right? And so from a management and leadership standpoint, we've got a gap, right? And that's what you see in most organizations still today is that there's this gap where the problem space has continued to escalate, but the management capability and understanding of how to deal with it has leveled off, right? And so that's where we got this gap. And so that's what I wanna talk about tonight for the most part is, what does that look like? What can we do about it? How do we start to, to put our hands around this and do something different, right, as leaders and managers? So uh, I've sort of leaded here in history management. So uh, I'm going to pop my chat up here just in case anyone does have questions or thoughts or comments, um, but I'm going to keep on rolling. So um, so that said, uh, what we want to go to is a little cone diagram. And so this is uh, when I was referring to Bill Joyner. This is, uh, we're going to talk about his book and his leadership model. Uh, his leadership model is a bit more complex than this. I'm going to simplify it down to just three, three sort of stages here for us to talk through. Um, but there is a bit more complexity to it. I think he's got maybe five or six stages actually on his model, but uh, there's a bit of nuance at the high end of this. And so uh, probably more complexity there than we need to talk about tonight. But just so, so you know, if you go read the book, there'll be a little more uh, nuance here at the top end of the spectrum, but most leaders aren't even to that stage. So oftentimes uh, not even ready to talk about that yet. So anyway, so uh, the model here again called leadership agility, that's the name of the book. And so uh, as we think about leaders building capability and becoming managers and leaders for the first time, uh, oftentimes the way that goes uh, looks like this. And I, I went through this myself. So uh, I was a, a software programmer building websites and, and different applications and things like that in a large company. And one day someone said, hey, Aaron, you're kind of good at that uh, code stuff. Do you want to manage the people that are writing code, right? And, and have a team and manage them, right? And of course, that's the typical scenario uh, that I see a lot, which is people in IT especially uh, go from doing the work to being the manager of people that do the work because they know how to do the work, right? And they can give some direction there. And they can uh, help people be successful in actually doing it. And so um, so from my perspective, that's what, what I went into. And we call that uh, that progression there, that sort of first step into sort of formal management and having that role and you know, sort of that HR job title uh, called expert leadership. And so in Bill Joyner's model, it's called the level called expert. And of course, as that tagline there, that name implies, it's because you, your credibility you have in being a manager is because you have expertise in the thing that the people are doing, right? So if you're developing or if you're, you're managing software developers, you understand how to develop the software and understand the language they're using and the tools and that kind of stuff. And you can directly support them, right? If they have a problem, they can come to you and you can help solve the problem. You can sit down and work with them, maybe pair with them, stuff like that, right? So you got expertise you're bringing to the table and that's why you have that, that level of credibility to be a manager, right? Now, that said, and we need these kind of people, right? So people that are, you know, maybe junior developers or, or, you know, even just people trying to work together, they need some direction oftentimes, right? And so that's where this kind of role comes in. It's, it's really vital in organizations, especially if you're trying to just get stuff done, right? That's sort of the focus. So the, the, the focus here for this person is really about getting work done, focusing on the work itself, right? And so that's a good thing, right? In organizations, though, <laughs> That's sometimes the problem. We can't we can't get things done. We can't get things over the finish line. Uh, we might be distracted and swirling. And so this person can really help us. Hey, let's buckle down and actually write some code and get this this module created and that kind of stuff. Right, run through the tests and so do those kind of things that can be helpful. And so the focus there is often, from a management standpoint, very tactical. So tactical focus. And so and think about the the sort of time horizon and and the the world they live in is oftentimes today, this week, right? Maybe this month, but usually even shorter term. It's like this this week, maybe this sprint if you're doing Scrum or something like that, right? So, so it's a pretty short-term focus because we're laser focused on just get the next thing done. And once we get that done, we'll get the next thing done, right? Just keep plowing through tasks and get stuff done. And that's how we add value, right? From a management standpoint is that I know how to get things done. I know how to help, how to help my people get things done. And so therefore, 
our ability to get things done adds value to the organization. And that's why we get paid every day, right? That's sort of the view. And so big focus from a, a management standpoint, leadership standpoint on being able to do work, right? And if we get into trouble, I can jump down in there and help the people too, right? And so that's kind of the focus there from a, an expert leadership standpoint. So, um, so that said, uh, first step in the journey, right? So before this, maybe you weren't a manager, then this is sort of the first step. And this is pretty typical, right? There, there's not a whole lot of scenarios that don't go this way that I know of, right? It's usually the first step in the journey. You know the things, so you start managing people that know the thing, and then we sort of go on from there, right? So from there, uh, as we advance and maybe start to gain a little bit more uh, big picture view of, of the work and things like that, we might start getting into another paradigm here, uh, which we call the achiever leader style. And what this looks like usually is maybe this person, you know, the expert leader starts to, to look at a little bit bigger picture. And it's not just about getting, the, you know, today's task done or the sprint's task done. It's a little bit bigger picture, like, you know, start asking, well, what, what are we trying to achieve? What goal are we going for here? Not just getting work done every day. That's, that's good, maybe helpful, but, but why, right? What, what are we trying to accomplish here? What's the bigger picture kind of stuff? And so start asking questions and start thinking about goals and strategy and what are we trying to uh, uh, accomplish as a whole so that we can all get more focused, right? It's not just about being busy, it's about, you know, accomplishing something. And so from that achiever leader standpoint, oftentimes this person is really good at motivating people, right? We can find a cause, identify a cause, and then get people rallied to that cause, get them aligned to it, and go forward. And so one of the big things that happens here in this kind of shift is that a little bit bigger focus, the ability to motivate people, but also the ability to go beyond your own expertise. And so what we often will see here is, let's say, uh, like in my case, I was a developer and became a development manager, right? So I had direct expertise of the people I was managing. But in the achiever leader, if we're going to try to achieve goals, those goals are probably bigger than just writing the code, right? we got to get more roles involved, business analysts, testers, uh, UX designers, things like that, right? People that I don't know their job and how to do their work. And if we get in trouble, I can't jump down and, and take the wheel and start doing the stuff, right? And so from an achiever leader standpoint, we've got to have a, a little bit bigger picture capability of how to lead people. It's not just, I know how to do your job so I can tell you what to do, but it's, I can help motivate you and maybe set the stage so that you can work together, right? So I might have a goal and be able to, to point to, you know, where we're going, but I'm relying on everyone else to be able to fill their role and, and bring their piece of the puzzle because I don't know how to do it, right? But I can help you and I can give clarity to where we're going in terms of goals. I can try to, you know, give you some motivation, you know, rah-rah speech, that kind of stuff. And so this is, this is really helpful oftentimes when we're trying to organize a larger group of people. And this is where we get into like large programs, maybe big projects, things like that, or big OKRs that are, you know, quarterly or yearly goals and things like that, right? We've got a, a mission to accomplish and this person is going to be able to help us sort of align and make sure we maintain focus there. And so from the achiever standpoint, we go beyond just managing the work to going for goals, right? So goals, large projects, OKRs, things like that can be really really a big focus here and going from a tactical focus to much more strategic focus. So not just about getting today's stuff done. It's about, you know, more, more than that bigger things that we're trying to accomplish that really matter. So, so from a leadership standpoint, uh, the focus here for the expert was to be able to do the job from an achiever standpoint. It's really about what we often think about as traditional leadership, the ability to lead people, right. To, uh, you know, have a vision and a goal and attract followers to that, right? And lead them to where, where you're trying to take them. And so this, this is really what we think about in most organizations as the top of the pyramid. This is the thing to be, if you're going to be a leader and a manager in most traditional organizations, is the ability to identify a goal, rally people to the cause and make it happen, right? And so that's a good thing, right? If we need to achieve goals, if we have quarterly objectives uh, that we need to accomplish and those are important to us to stay in business or, you know, for our, our um uh, for the stock market and things like that, like those are real things, right? So we need people that can accomplish those, not just get the work done, but can rally people and lead them to somewhere, right? So really valuable stuff, right? And as you progress here, consider that, you know, none of these are good or bad, right? The, these levels of progression here in our leadership model, but it's really more about just sort of a, a different way of thinking and a broader way of thinking that could be more valuable in different circumstances. But there are certainly circumstances where, you know what, we just need to actually get stuff done, right? And so let's let's focus and actually get work done, like accomplish the tasks and write code and things like that. So, so as I go through this, just keep in mind, I'm not saying that that the end of the spectrum here is the best thing and everyone should be there, but just really consider, you know, circumstances, right? This is a situational kind of thing, what's appropriate, what we're looking for. So 
So also notice up here, so we got like a Russian nesting doll kind of thing going on. So as you progress in this mindset from an expert-minded leader to an achiever-minded leader, think about that as like your default, but you can still shift down into the expert leader. You still have that capability inside of you, right? You still have that expertise you can draw on that, that capability of just you know, going back into that, that skill set of getting work done. So consider that as we go through here, there's the ability to sort of shift between these when you need to, as you progress up, you've got the ability to come back down. The challenge though is often if you're if you're sort of in a default expert mindset, you're maybe not even thinking about the fact that these other things could exist, right? Because you're so focused on just getting stuff done, right? So, so with that, we've got uh, two levels here, expert achiever. Uh, one thing to point out here too is uh, in Bill Drainer's research that was kind of interesting was uh, the, the percentage of people that sort of fall in these categories. And so uh, we call these two together heroic leadership. And this category of heroic leadership uh, covers a pretty big swath of the managers and leaders that are out there. And so uh, from his research, I think it's, uh, if I get my numbers right, it's 45% fall in the category of experts. So we did a bunch of surveys and research as he wrote his book. Uh, so about 45% in that category of expert, about 35% uh, fall in the achiever category, right? So that make, making that extra step, thinking about bigger picture goals, you know, that kind of stuff, strategic thinking. And so together, of course, we add up the numbers here. That's 80%. And so, you know, when I do this uh, in our, our leadership class, we have a good discussion here about, uh, well, that's 80%, great. Where's the other percentage, right? Uh, so if we add it up, it's 80%, there's 20% uh, missing. So where's that? And the easy, obvious thing would be, oh, it's over here, right? In this uh, third category, but it's not right. So we still got to add up to 100% though. Well, it's because there's a 10% of the population of managers who are managers that maybe aren't even on this list yet, right? They're over here, not even to that first category yet. And this happens sometimes when people get promoted into a manager role, but they haven't built the expertise yet. And so you could make a, a good argument that they probably shouldn't be managers yet, right? They're probably too early, too, too immature in terms of managerial capabilities and skills uh, to really have that role. But that happens, right? That happens sometimes out of necessity, sometimes it's a misunderstanding or a mistake. Uh, but it, it happens uh, more often than we, we would think, I guess. So about 10% of the population on the front end of this that we would call pre-heroic or, or pre-expert, uh, that they're not quite there yet. So you got 10% and then you got 80% here through these first two expert achiever categories. And the third one then uh, leading up to it is what we call catalyst leadership. And that's where this other 10% fits uh, on this diagram with, again, 10% uh, pre-expert. So the catalyst leader. So as the name implies, if we think about what it means to catalyze something or be a catalyst, right? You're trying to get a reaction to happen. Like think about a science experiment or, you know, back in chemistry or biology. And so you're trying to, you're trying to get a, a reaction to happen. You're, you're instigating, right? And so as we think about this leader, keep that in mind is they're, they're not necessarily passive, right? But they are trying to get action to happen. Maybe just not by them, but they're trying to catalyze their team, their organization, things like that. So just to keep that in mind as, as the name implies here. So catalyst leadership, things start to shift. And this is really where, again, we, we start to break away from what we call this heroic leadership category into catalysts and what we call post-heroic. And so back here in the heroic category, it's a lot about these individuals, right? The expert knows how to do the job. They can help people do the job. It's very direct interaction between them and the work and getting things done, right? The achiever, it's still about them, but not about doing the work. It's about motivating people and, and setting a goal and get people rallied to it. But it's still about them as sort of the hero in the story. And it's not about them being the hero doing the work and, and slaying the dragon, but it's the hero of them creating the goal, right? Identifying where we should go, right? What the journey should be. And so that's where this person is still crucial, right? And if they just disappear one day and like leave and go to another company, we're kind of in a tough spot, right? Because it was all kind of reliant on this person having that charisma and motivation and all that kind of stuff. And so, so I've been in that, that situation in my past and I can sort of point to those very specific situations where we had a, you know, a really high caliber, awesome achiever leader. And when they left, it was a huge letdown because it just sort of lets all the air out of the balloon because they were there holding up all the tent poles for everyone while they were there. We just didn't realize it until they left, right? So they were definitely in that, that achiever mindset. And so what happens as we go beyond that, it goes beyond the person themselves, it goes beyond the hero and becomes more about the broader organization, right? The, the, the we instead of just them, right? And so it becomes a different situation where it can be uh, much more stable long-term, right? And that's oftentimes what we're looking for 
in an agile transformation is not just to have a flash in the pan to you know, set up a few teams and then have it fall apart. We want this to be a long lived situation. So this idea with catalyst leadership is we're going beyond the hero to really create a situation and an environment where this is gonna work long-term and the hero or the, sorry, the leader is trying to set up a situation for exactly that, right? It's not about them, it's about us being successful long-term. So the catalyst leader here, what we're looking at going beyond just doing the work and goals, it's really about culture. We're gonna create a culture and an organization that will live on in the future in the way that we're, we're trying to lead, right? Uh, so creating that culture where everyone can be in it and opt in and really understand what's going on. And this leader, oftentimes some of the differences we start to see as we coach organizations, you know, we go through training classes and we coach organizations. And as we go in, we can often start to identify some key attributes and key differences here between the achiever and the catalyst leaders as they start to make, sort of bridge this, this gap. And so one of those things is that they start making decisions, right? The achiever is happy to make decisions, right? They're decisive. They can you know, help things move along, keep focused, that kind of stuff. But the, the catalyst oftentimes will add something to it, which is a really important thing. And it sounds like it's a tiny thing, but it's a huge thing, which is they don't just make the decision. They also explain why so that everyone can understand and they can opt in and they can see and ask questions and things like that. And there's a really big difference between just saying, here's the decision and here's the decision and why, right? And even maybe opening it up for some debate and discussion, right? In that case, if they've made a decision. But really what we're trying to do is make this a very collaborative situation with the catalyst leader. They're trying to set up an environment and then help people really get engaged in it, right? And that means maybe setting the stage or you know, presenting the problem. Instead of presenting a goal, they're presenting a problem to solve and eliciting people to join, right? And try to think through the problem and come up with ideas and brainstorm and, and work through it. So but really creating a culture where people can bring uh, a lot of their their full power in terms of that team we talked about earlier that that multi skilled multi functional cross functional you know diverse set of experiences and skills and all that kind of stuff bring that to the table because we're creating a culture where that's valuable right it's not just about getting to the task done it's not about achieving the goal it's about creating an environment where we can do the best things possible because we're all thinking harder about what the right thing even is right together so creating that kind of culture and that also leads us down the path from being very tactical to strategic to creating a vision of what the future could look like, but maybe not a specific goal, right? Or how to get there or a path to get there, but it's saying, hey, here's what I think we as an organization could be, right? Off into the future when we grow up, right? Maybe some far off unachievable thing that would take forever, but at least we've got a, a direction that we can rally around. And now it's up to us as an organization to opt in and start making it happen, right? And figure out how to get there and what is the right path and what things could we do? And maybe it's trying multiple things at, at the same time instead of one, one goal, maybe we try multiple experiments, right? At the same time and see which ones work and which ones don't and then try the next thing. And it gives us a lot more options on how to be successful as an organization, right? And, and as a manager and leader, it's a very different mindset to get into because you start to let go of the, the responsibility to be right all the time, but you're trying to set a vision be able to be able to opt in and allow them to try things and experiment and, and even be wrong, right? If we're trying experiments, that means we're going to fail sometimes and we're going to be okay with that, right? Back here in the heroic mindset, it's a very dangerous thing to be wrong, right? In a lot of organizations where, where this achiever leader is sort of the top uh, level of leadership and management in the organization, being wrong can be catastrophic. I know I've, I've been at a couple of very large banks, for example, that were you know, the most A-type cultures I've ever seen. And it was, it was, basically an unspoken thing that if you ever failed on a project, there's a black mark on your record and you will never get to the level you want to be at, right? Because you failed once. And so if that's the kind of organization you're in, this is really hard to get to this point as a catalyst leader, because you have to be okay with failure and trying things that don't work and taking risks, right? And not being right all the time, right? Being right all the time is, is something that we have in the expert mindset because we want to do the, the task right, right? Do it properly. And from an achiever, we want to have the right goal that we're going the right direction to achieve the thing. But as a catalyst, we're trying experiments and experiments can fail. And we actually want them to fail sometimes because if we're not failing, we're not trying hard enough. We're not taking enough risks. We're not being innovative enough, right? And so pretty important for us to, to really start thinking about the differences there between the, the heroic mindsets here of the expert achiever and what that looks like differently in the catalyst leader to start, start just really thinking differently about how the organization can start to take shape and really become even better than it is today. Not just achieving goals, but you know, off into the distance, off into the future, really setting ourselves up for long-term success. So the, the mindset here from the leader down here at the bottom, going from being able to do the thing to leading people to now the top level here that we think about 
there's really getting much more into a coaching mindset of really challenging people to be their best, to bring their best, to bring their best ideas and to be their best, right? To try to bring their whole selves to the equation uh, to really make things happen uh, for us for long-term success together, right? As an organization. So as, as this cone sort of builds out as, uh, you know, again, Bill Joyner's model here, there's a few other nuanced pieces beyond catalyst that he describes that we're just sort of lump it into one for tonight's discussion. Um, but three dimensions as this cone sort of grows and gets bigger as it progresses, right? And so the first dimension I'll mention here, just going straight out, is time horizon. And so what I mean by that is as we're progressing in this model, our view of the time horizon in which we're working is getting bigger and bigger, right? So back, back here at the expert, like I mentioned, the time horizon is usually like today, this week, this sprint, right? Very short-term focus because we're just trying to get things done, right? Just accomplish the task, check it off, go to the next task. So the, the short-term kind of focus there is very helpful in that kind of work, right? If that's our focus of just getting tasks done, we want to focus on them and get things done in a short amount of time. Uh, as we progress though and get into the achiever, the time horizon we're thinking is not just about what's going on today or this week, but it's about the time horizon of the goal. If it's a quarterly goal, we're thinking about that, right? It's the time horizon of the next three months. If it's this year's goal, think about it till the end of the year, right? So that time horizon starts to expand and we start thinking differently about what's possible because we have that, that expansion uh, of the time horizon of what we're trying to accomplish. And of course, the catalyst is thinking much bigger than that, right? It's not just about this week or this quarter. It's about long-term success, right? How do we create the environment in the company that we're going to be 10 years, 20 years from now, right? Trying to create the culture where that can work. And so we're taking a much longer term view of the world and how things are functioning. All right. So that's the first dimension here. Second dimension I'll mention, uh, I'll go out this direction. So we're out to the side in this cone is really, uh, so I'll draw the third one here as well. So markers dying, sorry, uh, is the view of the system. So first dimension was the time horizon uh, thought process. And the second one is the view of the system. When I say system, of course, I'm not talking about like an IT system or a platform or something. What I'm talking about is the system, like the environment, right, that they're in. And so for this expert leader, it's probably my department, my team, right? The view of the system is this group of people that's sort of within arm's reach of me because I'm trying to get work done and I'm thinking very tactically. So it's that sort of close group to me, again, team, department, project, you know, team, something like that, probably. Uh, the achiever, the view of the system is probably, so think about what the goal impacts, right? So it could be my department or my business unit, right? Something like that. So, so think about the, the view of the system that's people that are within arm's reach of the goal, right? The people that are impacted by it or have to directly contribute to achieving the goal, right? So that's really the view of the system. It's bigger, certainly, than our, our expert, but it's probably not the whole organization, right? We're thinking about this specific goal or this one OKR. What does that impact? Who's involved? Right, that kind of stuff. Who are the stakeholders, close people to it? So think about the goal or the program we're operating in. And of course, the catalyst is thinking about the view of the system as by the whole organization, right? The decisions we're making, the thought process we have. It's not just about one team or one goal we're trying to achieve temporarily. It's about the big picture. It's about a whole organization and how we work together. And might even go beyond that because guess what? Our company doesn't exist in isolation in the world. We have customers and suppliers and vendors and regulators and all those kind of things in the world. So those people are also part of our picture. They're part of our system, right? The ecosystem we live in. And so the ecosystem for the expert is more about team, achiever, more about maybe a department or business unit. And the catalyst, the system is really the ecosystem of the whole company plus probably. Okay. Um, and so the third dimension then, uh, and this might be the biggest one for us to consider in terms of differences here, uh, for leadership and, and the style we adopt is really about self-awareness so as you progress here you're becoming more and more self-aware right uh, of how you how you impact how you bring yourself and how that impacts others and so again expert leader very focused on being right answering the question achieving the task that kind of stuff and sort of the view of self the self-worth is much, very much wrapped up in the ability to do the job, the skill I have, and can I apply that directly to getting work done? And that's sort of the view, right? And I made it, and the way I view my value to the organization is exactly that, getting work done, right? So the view for the achiever is their ability, not necessarily just get the work, uh, get the work done, but to motivate and, and encourage and, uh, you know, again, identify goals and help people achieve them and things like that. And that's how I bring value to the organization. My self-awareness, 
is somewhat limited probably by that. I, I feel like I could deliver value that way. And so my self-awareness is sort of contained to, how do I get that to happen? I'm gonna pay attention to the things that help that occur. And so for example, if I get feedback, right? The expert may not have time for feedback. They're too busy getting stuff done. And so they just wanna get more work done, right? The achiever oftentimes is interested in feedback if it can help me achieve the goal. And so their self-awareness may be limited to that. Like the feedback I will be willing to accept or listen to or participate in needs to have a purpose, right? And that purpose is usually wrapped up in those goals, right? The goals, quarterly, yearly, OKRs, that kind of stuff. If you've got feedback for me, I'll hear it if it helps me achieve the goal. If not, let's save it for later. We'll deal with it some other time, which oftentimes doesn't happen, right? So from a self-awareness for the catalyst, of course, oftentimes they're, they're not only open to feedback, whatever feedback you have, but they're actually asking for it, right? So again, one of those big differences we see where leaders make a decision and then say why, and give reasoning and that kind of stuff. The catalyst leader, one of those things you see is they're not just open to feedback, but they're asking for it. They're saying, hey, everyone, I want to get better. I want everyone to get better. How can I help uh, become better? Give me some feedback. Tell me what I'm doing that might be helpful or harmful. And how can I you know, start operating differently or, or behave differently? Or you know, if we're not looking at things the right way, give me feedback, right? Let's all treat each other a bit more as peers from that perspective, because we're all trying to improve and all trying to get better, right? And they're trying to catalyze the situation and be a good role model for everyone else. And so that view, that self-awareness, they really start uh, broadening that perspective about what's possible, how they come across, how they can impact the organization by, by things like their own behavior and awareness of, of what they have going on. And so you'll often see these people, you know, becoming learners in a lot of different areas, right? Experts, I'm reading the book on how to write Java, you know, The Achiever, maybe books about, uh, you know, heroes and strategy and, you know, achieving goals and how to do OKRs better and things like that, right? But the catalyst is broadening their horizon about what they're learning about, because there's so many things they can draw inspiration from to create that organization environment that we're looking for that's conducive to, to becoming more agile, right? So that, that's sort of a, a quick run through here uh, of the model here. Again, a uh, few more nuances if you go read the book. Um, uh, in terms of higher levels here. So there's uh, two levels beyond Catalyst. Uh, so we, we sort of summarized here, Catalyst is top 10%. I think the way it actually works out is like uh, five or 6% Catalyst, then the next category is two or 3%, and then like one or 2%. Uh, but again, so nuanced, we're not gonna worry about it for tonight, but uh, all sort of fit in that same bucket of that, that line of thinking and going that direction, right? Uh, of really setting up the environment, getting out of tactical you know, day-to-day -day work management, and getting into a situation where you're coaching the organization, coaching people to, to be their best and that, to bring their all, right? To, so we can all become better, right? Challenge each other uh, to find the right things to do and then do them well. So with that, uh, last thing I wanna mention here um, is as we're leaders leading through change. So this is a sort of a simpler version or a simpler diagram than the other ones, but I, I like to, to show this one in terms of like very ta tangibly, like what can leaders start to do if they start getting to this catalyst mindset and more towards that direction, that management 3.0, catalyst mindset, that kind of stuff. And so as we're going through change, and of course, if you're going through an agile transformation, that's a big change. There's other changes, right? Uh, small changes, big changes, all kinds of changes. But, but oftentimes we're usually thinking about the same kind of curve, which is we're starting with some kind of status quo, right? Current state, and we institute some change and it dips. And of course, our goal with that, if it's an intentional change, is that we come back up the other side to a better place, right? That's what we're looking for is we start with the status quo and we institute change because we're trying to do something better, right? Something different, something better, but it takes work to get there, right? And people don't just directly move that direction. They've got to sort of let go of the past, right? Go through, through a bit of disbelief and uh, disengaging with the old, learning the new thing and coming up the other side, right? That's sort of how that change curve generally works. And so as leaders, what we want to do is using this catalyst mindset, this you know, more team-based approach of engaging people is to try to improve this curve, right? And so starting with status quo, as we jump off this cliff, what would be really nice as leaders is that we can help people get to that better place earlier by creating a way to not dip so far, to come up faster, and maybe even come to a better place, right? So we improve that change curve uh, through leadership. And so the things that, that I think really go into that, uh, helping that happen as a catalyst leader, number one, helping this, this curve not be so deep is safety. Creating safety for people to try things and experiment, right? 
So if we're going to ask people to do something different and change, they're basically jumping off this cliff into something new, right? Where they have to let go of the old and you know, there might be some disbelief that that can happen and they might have some you know, baggage from a previous change we tried that they're, they're hesitant to jump off. Leaders need to create safety, right? For people to, to understand that it's okay to try this thing, right? We're going to support you no matter what, right? Even if the change doesn't work out the way we wanted to, we're still here. We've got your back. It's okay to try it, right? Take the experiment, take the risk, right? Let's give it a try. So creating that kind of safety in the organization for them to just get started, right? Jump off the edge. And so creating that safety net. And to pull this curve back, right, and to get things happen earlier is a bit about engaging them. So creating ways for people to engage in the change, getting engagement with the organization, the people that are affected by the change, right, the people that's happening to, right, we don't want it to happen to them, we want it to happen with them, right? So we're starting to pull them in and start to explain more about the why. Why do we think this is the right idea? Do you have different ideas? Do we, you know, let's talk through it and make sure that we're on the same page. And so getting engagement from people in the change, right? Where it's not just happening to them, they're a part of it. Really getting to participate, uh, get a say, and that gives them deeper understanding, ways to engage, and maybe even ways to opt out if it doesn't make sense for them, right? Once they, they get to that point. And then the last thing is we, we try to uh, increase the, the vertical here for the, uh, the change. Here is about clarity. And this gets back to vision of why are we doing this? What do we think the future looks like? Why is this gonna be better than where we are? And really helping to paint that picture. And if we're doing that with safety and engagement, we might even end up in a better place where as we engage people, they might have better and more interesting ideas than the leaders even had at the start when they said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna go this direction. We're gonna try to achieve this. As they engage people and start opening up the conversation and getting more ideas on the table, we might even discover new and better places we can be that, that actually increase this uh, this curve as well. So as we think about that change curve and sort of applying some of the stuff we talked about uh, in terms of that those management paradigms of management one, two, three point oh, and moving through that expert achiever catalyst, of course, those are pretty well lined up with the, the management uh, one, two, three point oh. As we start to apply some of that thinking, hopefully this is the kind of stuff we can have happen in the organization. So very simple concept, uh, of course, hard to do, hard to pull off, but that's the kind of thing we want to have from leaders is start to get more toward that direction of catalyst leadership where they're engaging people, explaining things, getting people to participate uh, and really bring all of the, the valuable things that they have at their disposal to the situation so we can help each other go through change like this. And of course, as we start going through change uh, better, right? If the dip is less, we get through it quicker and we get to a better place. If we can do that over and over and over again with all the change we have going on in our organization, that's gonna add up pretty fast and it's gonna outpace competitors that are trying to go through the same kinds of things, right? Whether that be an agile transformation or new product development and innovation, right? Any of those kind of things, if we can do those smoother, better, faster, right? It's going to empower us to, to really do better as an organization. And that usually results in happier people, happier customers, and all that kind of stuff too. So, so this leadership mindset shift we're talking about is pretty important uh, as we're going through any kind of uh, changes like this. So again, just sort of recapping uh, what our uh, leadership development here uh, with Expert Achiever Catalyst from Bill Joyner, the, the um, leadership agility model. And then just flash this back up here for a second as well. Of the history of management. Again, those are pretty well lined up with the expert sort of mindset, the achiever mindset about how to manage based on outputs probably and goals and the outcomes that we're looking for from uh, the catalyst leader as well. So, so with that, uh, that's what I had uh, as far as content for tonight. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any, or I want to chat through any more of this. I'm happy to click through my slides, which is really easy and tear off paper. But <laughs> so let's see. I do have one one question. It's a direct message uh, to me. I totally missed like half an hour ago. Uh, so said uh, from Michael. Good framing of the topic. Uh, thanks. What about people doing the work on uh, teams? Where are they at in their progression and their ability to take more responsibility and complexity? Is there a gap there and how is that being addressed? That is a great question. So, so yeah, we focused a lot on leadership, right? That I talked about tonight, but uh, one of the, the challenges, right? That uh, leaders might have is, do they feel like their people are ready? Which I think is, is kind of just your question, right, Michael? So are the people ready to step up and take that responsibility? And that's often, you know, we, we think about an agile transformation. That's one of the concerns is, hey, we're gonna put, you know, the teams in charge of a lot of decisions. And the concern is, are they, are they ready for that? They're not used to it, right? And so that, that's something I think for you, for you to gauge, right, as you go through this kind of progression. And, and part of that manager and leadership mindset shift is to get more towards that maybe coaching and mentoring and, 
and really engaging with people, not just to tell them to do the work, but engaging with where are your concerns, where are your problems, what are your personal goals right, that you have for yourself? Not organizational goals, but personal goals for you. Are you trying to grow your skills in a certain direction? Are you, do you have passions about a certain type of work or a certain you know, customer profile you want to uh, try to make happy, things like that? So, so that, that should be part of that conversation. And that, you know, that is where sort of managers and uh, you know, the people development, HR kind of responsibilities really mesh is really instead of managing the work, they should be managing the people and their needs, right? Helping to understand, are they ready for that? Do they feel comfortable in taking that responsibility? And do they feel, or do they feel comfortable enough to try it, right? Maybe they don't feel 100% comfortable because they haven't done it before, but do they feel good enough and that we have enough support in place that they can try it, right, in a safe way, that it's not going to be a, a catastrophic event or something? So, so certainly something to engage and be aware of. And I, I would say, you know, oftentimes there, there's maybe too much hesitancy there. I mean, people are pretty resilient, right? And they can learn fast if we give them the opportunity. But there certainly are cases where they're either, uh, you know, people or, or organizational cultures that haven't prepared them well for that and have maybe put them in a position where they, they aren't going to be successful without significant support and training. So, you know, every organization is a little bit different uh, in that regard, I suppose. But you know, I, I would say in general, my experience is people do like to do that uh, if we set them up for success. So, but happy to talk more about that. Or Jay, Ron, anyone have any, any additional comments there? I know you guys, you guys have been around the block more than I have even probably. <laughs> so Rich, Rich Sheridan um, talks about uh, how they hire at uh, Mellow Innovations in Ann Arbor. Yeah in his book, Joy, Inc. And he talks about, um, you know, bringing in 50 candidates at a time, pairing them with each other, with the goal of each candidate to get the get their pair hired. And they use that as a, a, as a way of, of determining whether the teamwork and the support for each other is there among the people they're hiring. Now, um, that's really good for Rich because he started his company from scratch and he always, as far as I can tell, he's always hired that way. He's always hired for that culture. Now, um, uh, transforming, uh, so you said earlier that you're trying to get large corporations to be like startups. We're walking into the situation where um, many of us, maybe everybody here walks into the situation where uh, we've got people who are already on board, who've been managed by uh, second generation managers instead of third generation managers, um, and the and the um, and and uh, and way too many first generation managers actually who are telling them what to do, yeah. and and train employees. I'm building on Michael's question, but they're training employees to say, uh, "Okay, I did that. Tell me what to do next," as opposed yeah. to teams and engagement um uh so the, the, there's that that spectrum and i wonder if you could comment on that on that spectrum and the challenge we have walking into existing organizations that have been managed by uh, in in uh management 2.0 and sometimes management 1.0 kinds of ways yeah certainly i mean that if that's the the sort of environment and culture they've had that they're used to that that can be a challenge right so it's it's trying to get them to to think differently about what it means to be an employee or a, you know, an individual contributor. And as they go into a team, there's, it's, it's often counterintuitive because they've been managed or, or you know, held accountable to certain measures that we're asking them to stop worrying about so much, not just the managers of people, right? And so, yeah, it, it can be easier for them to just say, hey, boss, what's the next task? I'll do it, right? I'm good at it. I'll do it. Just tell me what it is, right? And, and not have to think so much about the what and just worry about the how. And of course, when we, we go to this, we're, we're really thinking about the what, how, and even the why, right? And so that's a, a different set of responsibilities, uh, certainly increased responsibilities, which can be exciting for some people, but also scary, or maybe just sound like a lot of work I don't want to do. <laughs> and I've encountered that quite a bit, right? There's, I'm sure you guys have too, but there's, you know, across the spectrum, there are people that have maybe been in the company for a long time. They're used to the ways things have worked and they're okay with it, right? And they're, they're happy to just keep going that way. And if we're going to, you know, move their cheese, they're not excited about it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. What's your experience there, Jay? I was going to say that, you know, Bill and then did really good. And of course, you know, Peter Singer, the fifth discipline, you know, talks a lot about this. And what's hard, I find, and it's continuous, 
is the ability to adapt and change change based on whatever happens, right? So for example, so chat GPT and AI now is making, uh, so to me, that's that's the next paradigm shift. So we had many paradigm shifts in my life, right? We had the internet, you know, we had uh, the uh, iPhone and so forth that changed society and people in general, right? So I think this is the next one, right? So a lot of us has been having a conversation. Well, what does that mean for Agile? So a lot of us are thinking, well, now you have a digital person as part of your team. And that digital person is chat GPT or generative AI. And, and now we have to learn how to uh, have that person as, as a team member. And, and that's, I think, is going to be the next paradigm shift is like, okay, well, what does that mean? So now, I don't know if you all know this, but there's, you know, generative AI out there that can generate code and generate algorithms and generate test, testing scripts and conditions and so forth, right? So back in, you know, back in my day when I was a software engineer, now, and, and I don't know if you all remember in the 80s, we had a thing called case tools where we could generate code and everything else. There was a very popular ones that I was involved in. And now we're revisiting that, right? So that, then the question is, okay, what does that mean for our workforce, mm -hmm. right? And if we're talking about Agile or Scrum, I'll just pick on Scrum. If we're talking about Scrum, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Sutherland is saying, he's working with a couple people that, okay, well, Chat GPT or a, a generative AI is is a Scrum team member now. Okay, but what does that mean, right? And when we look at the workforce and and management and leadership that you talked about, so if if I'm at a catalyst leader, does that mean I uh, take advantage of and incorporate AI? into my leadership skills and, and my teams. So I'm throwing, not to, right? that, I'm throwing <laughs> that out there, see yeah. what you think. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, yeah, it's a really, I uh, actually was, I sat in on a couple hour presentation earlier today um, from a guy who's uh, deep into cybersecurity and AI and uh, showed me a, a lot of tools I didn't even know existed. Uh, AI, the like chat GPT, everyone knows that one, right? There's a bunch of other ones that I hadn't realized like how far it'd gone just in the last few months, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I was looking at that and saying, oh, wow, I mean, these, these are really amazing tools um, that if you don't incorporate those into your work, you're crazy. But yeah, you're, you're right. From a leadership and management standpoint, a lot of those things can be incorporated as well to uh, you know, start leading and managing better and, and starting to envision what, you know, what's possible out there for the organization. And you know, we, we just used some, in some simple exercises today for brainstorming, for example, right? Uh, different company ideas and things like that. It was, you know, you, you advance, you know, in minutes, what you would have done in hours or days, of course, right? So even in that kind of thinking, I think from a management leadership standpoint, it'll be pretty amazing to see what happens in the next year even, right, with that kind of stuff. And so you're gonna see managers who are still in this sort of one, one and a half. When I do this, I do a little poll in class sometimes, right? And say, where do you feel like your leaders are? And a, a pretty consistent one and a half, right? 1.5 paradigm right here in a lot of organizations still today, right? Depends on industries and things like that, but but it, it usually nowhere above two, right? So there's 1.5 to two. And you can imagine thinking about like in the mindset of these kind of managers and leaders and how they think about their, their adding value and how their people are adding value and, and how they, they just manage the situation. You add that kind of capability and speed and, and thinking on top of it, the heads explode, right? <laughs> And so you really, from a management leadership standpoint, there's gotta be a big catch up here or people are just gonna be left on the side of the road completely. Yes, and I'm curious to see what happens. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting old, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure <laughs> once I die, amazing things are gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> any, anyone else has any questions or comments? Uh, you should, you can, I think I gave you power to un, Unmute. If not, let me know, and I can. You can just talk. There's not that many people. Hey, Aaron. I'll say something. Uh, great talk, by the way. Really, really enjoyed this. Um, 
with the different levels of leadership, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking about that is that sometimes we have the heroic style leader in a place where there really should be a coaching leader. How do you help a company identify that need? Or can yeah, you? Yeah, it, it can be a tough thing, right? So, so yeah, just going back to this, really thinking about that self-awareness aspect. If you're in, say, an expert leader mode, right, that, that sort of default mindset, Oftentimes, you're not taking the time to even understand that these others are there, right? So I could tell an expert leader all day long that they should be more coaching-minded, but it's not going to permeate very well usually, right? So it's, it's a tough thing. So just really, it depends, right? And, and there's things that you can maybe do, right? So just tactically, things like, you know, share a blog post or a, a book and things like that or an article from a magazine that they respect, like Forbes or something, right? Um, th those can be helpful. But oftentimes it's if they've got to just sort of learn their way into it a bit. And so that I mean, certainly in our classes, we try to expose expose some of this stuff for people to just at least know these things are there and get interested in that kind of stuff. The funny part, of course, is you know, you see the percentages up here. Actually, you come to my class, everyone thinks they're a catalyst leader, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody yeah. thinks they're above normal, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's kind of funny. And I, I had one uh, one guy one time who was very clearly like on the border here between expert and achiever. And in the class, he wanted to pause the class as a private client class at a company. And he decided he wanted to pause the class for like 45 minutes to make everyone declare where they were on the paradigm in detail, <laughs> which is totally an expert behavior, right? Because <laughs> he thought he was a catalyst and wanted everyone else to know that he was a catalyst, but obviously it's like giving expert behaviors. But anyway, self-awareness, right? They're, they're often, if you're on the, this end of the spectrum, oftentimes you're not as aware of how you're coming across, what's possible. And you may think you're over here, but you're not you know, quite in that mindset as a default all the time. So it can be tough, especially if that's like the senior leaders. And so, you know, it's a good point because you can certainly have CEOs that are here, right? And frontline managers who are catalysts, right? That, that's, it's the mindset that they have. Now they might be utilizing, like if I'm a frontline manager, I might be a default catalyst, but I've got to sort of use my expert capability because that's my job, right? Um, but it's hard if you're a CEO and you're in expert mode, right? Because then you're always thinking about just the very tactical kind of stuff and, and you're going to miss things that you could be doing in terms of opportunities and stuff. And it can be very frustrating for people that report to you right? yeah. in the organization. So kind of along those lines, if you, if you are kind of in the expert mode, can you stretch yourself and try to be an achiever in different areas if you're at least aware that, oh, hey, my team needs this leadership? style right now yeah okay. yeah certainly so and and part of it is you know you're, you're building capabilities and skills uh as you progress right and so one of the tools that um bill joiner has and we're, we're certified in which is his leadership agility 360 tool right so it's basically this model much more detailed and has different dimensions to it uh and so for example some of those are uh you know how you lead teams or how you deal with conflicts or how you um uh, I'm blanking on the other couple off the top of my head, but yeah, so many different dimensions. There's I don't know, 20, 30, 40 different uh, aspects that you sort of rate and then you get 360 review from others. And that sort of helps you hone in on, you know, where you might be a default expert, but you might have extended yourself in a few areas here into Achiever that you can build on, right? If you want to, uh, could be other areas where you thought you were way over here and the rest of your peers say you're over here. There's a gap in self-awareness there that you might want to focus on, stuff like that. So those could be, you know, if people are open to those kind of tools, that can be really, I found those really eye-opening in a lot of cases for people and make, you know, having them take a step back and say, whoa, I'm coming across a lot different than I thought I was. You know, maybe I should look at that. And it's, again, not that they need to all be catalysts, but it's more about self-awareness and then being selective about where do you want to apply your energy for learning and improvement for yourself, right? Um, or if your organization finds value in certain aspects, then you know, let's talk about that and figure out where to focus to. Not just for your personal goals, but how does that align to your organizational needs and that kind of stuff. So cool. great. So Thank there, you. yeah, sure thing. Uh, so there, there's that tool. Um, you know, there's uh, of course other 360s out there, but Bill Joiner has one specific to this model that we use quite a bit with leaders. So cool. And and I would su suggest uh, has anyone ever heard of Bill Campbell? So if you get the book Trillion, Trillion Dollar Coach. 
and see how Bill coached uh, many of the luminaries in, in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, Google and Apple and, and so forth. Um, he he it kind of talks about that. So the coaching is at all different aspects of the organization, including individuals, right? And, and the ability uh, to coach Steve Jobs, uh, and Steve was an arrogant SOB, um, is, is amazing that he would even listen to you and take time to uh, consider changes in his behavior and his management style, right? And that's, I think, that's the experience we have in most uh, companies, right? As, as we coach people, if someone's making multi-million dollars a year, that's their salary and everything, and, and we come and suggest these changes, and then they've been very successful in their life, you know, why would they listen to us? And I think that's, that's an important consideration that we have to uh, think about. Doug, you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, and I'll put it down. Um, I, I'm just curious, is there any sort of correlation between your model here and the success that the organization has in a agile transformation? Mm. That's a good question. I, I don't have any data uh, for it. And interestingly enough, Bill Joyner, his book is called Leadership Agility. But when he's thinking about agility, it's more the, the dictionary definition versus the agile manifesto definition, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think he's thinking so much about like an agile transformation like we would think about. Um, now that said, it would can sort of connect the dots and say, well, probably <laughs> because we're, we're trying to get, you know, from an agile perspective, more people oriented, more about experimentation, about, uh, you know, accomplishing things in, in small pieces, but in a direction, right? Uh, and so you can sort of see like some of the dots connect to, yeah, the, the catalyst leader in this coaching mindset of really like engaging and empowering people and, and getting that, you know, management 3.0 style probably does. I don't have any data to say that it definitively does, but I, I would expect that there's a pretty high correlation there. And I think from, so from a business, so beyond agile transformation, Bill Joyner's data is about business results. And he does see a pretty good correlation between business results and more catalyst leadership. Right, because they're thinking more visionary and, and open to possibilities for the future and things like that. So he does in his book, I think it's actually in the book as well. He, he goes through it in his um, his uh, coaching training classes that I've been through as well and shows a lot of like scatter plot data uh, and, and sort of mapping these uh, uh, leadership levels to that as well. I'm pretty sure it's in the book too. Um, that shows business results. So not agile transformation, but business results at least. To map a couple other things to that, Doug, uh, the transition from project to product mm -hmm. is very is very tied to outcome orientation over output orientation, mm -hmm. which is which which um, Aaron's just talked about in terms of the uh, in terms of the model and the and the the growth here. Um, so there's there's another uh, another data point. To tie it, so I, 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 I suspect. So uh, Aaron wasn't willing to go there, but I suspect there's a lot of correlation between a lot of things here. Right, and, right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. We've been uh, actually funny enough getting getting more requests for uh, uh, project to product transformation than we do agile transformation, which a lot of the similarities, right? But but yeah, to your point, Ron, there, there's very very similar pieces of the puzzle here that are that are all correlated, right? Going through an agile transformation, not doing a project to product is pretty tough. Like those are pretty pretty solid Venn diagram overlap there. <laughs> so um, I had one more question, uh, Doug. Any anything else? You had? Thank you. Thank okay. you. I had one more question. Uh, Michael had a direct message to me. So is there a relationship between these management levels and whether a workforce is fully on site, hybrid, or remote? And are these concepts and ways of working orthogonal? So. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, we've uh, been doing we've been doing these classes and talking about this stuff. Bill Joyner's book was written, you know, a good ten, probably more than fifteen years ago, um, and so well before COVID and that kind of stuff. But you know, we're seeing a lot, probably a lot more need for people to be less expert in a, in a virtual environment because you just you're not there, right? You're not physically in contact with people in the same way you used to be, and so that that expert mindset of sort of being able to be over the person's shoulder, and that's how you. Sort of confirm that good things are happening 
uh, is really hard to do in a virtual environment, as I'm sure we all know, right? So there's a lot more trust, <coughs> or kind of tickle my throat, um, a lot more trust that has to be in place, right? Uh, to be to be effective as a manager in that environment, you've got to really focus more on on probably these two, right? The the goal setting and the the culture, than you can on just the tactical sort of like work management input kind of approach to management. So I think in a in a hybrid or or fully remote situation, it's going to be tough, tougher and tougher to be successful as an expert leader uh, from a management standpoint, right? Um, now that said, the, the and not. I'll go off on a bit of a tangent on your question here, but you know, I have a lot of questions or a lot of conversations about that topic of, you know, companies are they going back in the office or are they never going to go back? Are they going to go back hybrid or something like that? And I think the the thing that uh, I often come back to is any of those are probably okay for people that are experienced and been in the workforce for ten years or more. But if you're brand new out of college, it's a really tough situation to get into, and you need someone to help you understand what the heck to do, right? And so that's where like expert leaders are really valuable for someone in the first handful of years in their career. I, I just think back to myself, if I wasn't there in an office with people that I could turn to and talk to quickly and ask the manager or escalate a problem or something like that, man, I would be in a very different place right now, probably. So, so it's a, a really something interesting to think about there is those new hires, like how do we help them be effective at getting up to speed? And if we are going to be a virtual, fully virtual company, like we got to be really thoughtful about those kind of people, especially because they just aren't used to you know, how to work in an environment, right? A lot of us have been around for a while. We can adapt pretty fast, right, to these kind of things. I imagine most of us, like, going virtual was not as big a deal. But, you know, for some people, it's a, a real problem. So, um, so hopefully that helps uh, answer your question, Mike, a little bit and just add a little flavor to the side of that one. But uh, so in, in terms of, you know, are these uh, sort of things orthogonal? Like, is there, uh, you know, sort of clear distinctions between them? So uh, I, I would say... Not necessarily, right? There, there's sort of a blend here. It's not like you know you you cross this bridge and then you successfully you know checked off box one, but I think there's there's certainly indicators, uh, and it's more about like default behaviors as well. And so it could be that you know your your default behavior is expert, but you you have a lot of achiever tendencies. That's you know pretty normal as you advance. And again, back to that 360, you can sort of see some some uh, you know qualitative data around that from from peers and yourself as to where you think you are. It's not just like you're you're here here. And actually in the 360, it gives you, I think across these three spectrums, it's like nine options altogether. So there's maybe like three degrees of this, three degrees of this, three degrees of this. And it's sort of, you know, a bit more detailed to help you more precisely uh, identify where you feel like you are, where your peers feel like you are, uh, so that you can take effective action, right? So so not, not quite uh, as rigid as it appears in this, I guess. Right? So, so with that, uh, happy to answer more questions, but uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone for having me. Jay, thanks. I uh, appreciate you inviting me. This was great, and uh, it's, it's good to see you, Ron. It's been a while. I see you in person sometime, too. So. <laughs> but uh, and thanks to everyone. So appreciate the questions, appreciate the discussion, and uh, hopefully I'll see you again sometime. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you, Aaron. A very informative and, and, and enticing knowledge as, as we evolve. Um, if you have any questions, questions or anything, we're going to publish this uh, recording in, in our uh, YouTube account. And Aaron, you know, I think we published your um, email, right? And I, I put it in the chat as well, but it's simple. Aaron at projectbrilliant.com. Yep. That's right. So, and Aaron's very nice gentleman. If you have any questions or you want to contact him and have more conversations, he's he's open to that. So again, thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Um, we'll have another. I think, I think we're lining up other people coming up next. I think, um, I think Ron has someone that he's lining up. I'm also lining up uh, Jonathan Smart or John Smart. Uh, sooner, safer, happier. He wrote the book on that. We'll line him up here. He'll be coming up soon as as well to talk to us. Uh, so again, thank you everyone. Uh, again, we'll uh, put the video out there for others to uh, recording to uh, uh, use it. Uh, Aaron's available, have conversations with him. And everyone, what is this? This is like a Wednesday, right? Everyone have a great Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thank you all. <laughs>